Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. A 13-day siege, a defiant pledge of victory or death, a 90-minute battle, a decisive loss. From the ashes of defeat rose a battle cry, remember the Alamo. Nearly 200 years later, those words have ricocheted across the world. How did this small battle leave such a large footprint? Today, we reveal why the Alamo became a worldwide phenomenon, what about it continues to strike a chord, and why the story includes something for everyone. I'm your host, Emily Balkum. We're joined by Ernesto Rodriguez, the Alamo senior curator, historian, and lecturer of Alamo history. Ernesto, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure to be here. You're a native of San Antonio. What sparked your interest in the Alamo? My interest in the Alamo started as, at a very young age. I remember coming to visit the Alamo when I was a young boy and uh, telling my mom and uh, my sister and a cousin, I would love to work there one day. Now, being a young person, I wanted to be more of a gardener because it seemed like fun being outside climbing trees. I never thought that I would come back and actually work on the museum side of it. And you have now been here 24 years. That is incredible. Can you please describe your educational journey to get to the, your position today? So when uh, I went to the university and I obtained my Bachelor of Arts in History, then I went and obtained my Master's in History. And, uh, and through the course of my career here, I've uh, attended several different types of educational seminars and so it's been a nonstop journey. And so one of the most important things that I've learned being not only here, but in, in education is you never stop learning. And so it's a continuous journey. So every day you learn something new and the Alamo is no different. So every day a new piece of the puzzle falls into place. And imagine that this puzzle has about a million pieces and we're probably about 50,000 pieces in. And we're going to dive into the Battle of the Alamo in just a moment, but because you've been here 24 years, so remarkable, you've met thousands and thousands of visitors from all over the world. What's the farthest you can remember someone traveling to see the Alamo in person? Well, we've had people from anywhere from South Africa to Tibet, but one of the most memorable experiences was um, we were standing in front of the church and a family walks up. And they start talking to us, and they're English. And they say, hey, you know, our dad doesn't know we're here. It's been our dad's dream to come visit the Alamo, and we were finally able to do this for his 65th birthday. He's been a fan of the, of the place since he was a little boy. And so we gave mom and dad a trip. And so they said, is there anything we can do to hide us? And we're like, yeah, we'll hide you. So we hid them. And I remember watching the, the father and the mother arrived, and um, they told us what they were wearing because they were in communication with the mom. And uh, we went out, said hello, and the minute he saw his kids, he broke down and started crying. It was on one of those bucket list days, and having his whole family here. The lifelong dream, then mm -hmm. seeing his children here. Yeah, with him, and it's a, it was an incredible moment, and it's one of those moments that stays with you because this story means something to people. That's what we call an Ala moment around here. Mm -hmm. What is it about the Battle of the Alamo that draws so many people in? The Battle of the Alamo draws so many people in because of the fact that most people can relate to it. No matter what country you're from, there's a similar type of battle that occurs that changes the course of their history. It just so happens that our battle here is the battle for the Alamo. And it's a small, I like to say it's basically, it's a international event that happens in a, our local site. Because what happens here will affect not only the history of the United States, but it will affect the history of Mexico and the history of the world. So this little battle here that lasts 90 minutes changes the course of world history. Well, the Alamo defenders came from far off places, including Western Europe. Why did people from other states and even other countries care so much about this cause? It starts with the idea of opportunity. And when you think about wealth and how to survive in the 19th century, if you own land, you can be self-sufficient. And Texas has that to offer. 
But there's also this idea that's running through many of the defenders that has come from their parents. Many of their fathers and grandfathers had fought in the American Revolution. They have this idea of a republic. And so when Santa Ana is elected in, in 33, they're all in favor of him because he's a federalist, believing in the federal constitution. In 35, he switches his tune, and with the help of people in Congress, he overthrows the constitution and centralizes all authority. That centralization and the loss of rights affects everybody, and so people are starting to come to help the cause because they have friends that are in Texas, and if your friends lose their rights, you're going to go help. So many people start immigrating to Texas for the cause of fighting for rights of others, and it just gets keeps growing and growing and growing, but we're not a standalone battle. Mexico breaks into full-blown civil war, and as a result, Santa Ana's army is having to take down many revolts. It just so happens that the revolt in Texas becomes an independence movement, which will eventually succeed, and we become a republic. Well, as you pointed out, the battle didn't last very long, 90 minutes, but it became a rallying point for the rest of the Texas Revolution. Mm -hmm. When um, the loss here and the loss at Goliad, on the, basically with the execution on the 27th of March, sets off a course of events that will eventually lead to Texas independence. Now, at the Battle of San Jacinto on April 21st, the rallying calls are, remember the Alamo, remember Goliad, God in Texas. Well, why are they yelling that out? Well, they knew the men that had fought at this battle and lost. They knew the men that died at Goliad. It was personal. It was a personal fight. They were their neighbors. They were their brothers. You know, they were their friends. And as a result, it's personal. And those, those cries on that day echo to this day. Because we all know the phrase, remember the Alamo. My job is to help you learn why. So Texas wins its independence about 10 years later, joins the United States. About 15 years after that, there's a civil war. It's a lot of upheaval in a very short time in history. So how did the story of the Alamo survive? So the story of the Alamo survives because people always tend to remember events that affect them personally or that they have the similar experience. And then with all the fighting that happens in all this, the course of our history, people tend to remember. What's interesting about our story is that it's a story that is brought together from people that are voiceless for the most, most of their time. Joe, Travis's slave, gives the first narration of what he saw at the battle. It's written down by, um, by Gray and... Um, that story starts to circulate. And then they interview other survivors, women and children. People that were typically never talked to are now being sources of what they saw. And so our narrative is a narrative of the voiceless. And it's really interesting because it starts to grow and grow. People are writing down these stories from people, and they really start to be compiled at the beginning of the 20th century even more because the people that fought in the revolution are starting to die off. And they want their stories to continue, so people really start focusing. And at the same time, what's happening at the beginning of the 20th century? We've got organizations of women that are preserving sites, and we're no different. And it's been said the Alamo Church may not exist today as a preserved historic site without the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. Why did they point to the Alamo and say, in the lawn barrack, and say, this is worth keeping? So... They did that because they were remembering their ancestors that fought and died during the revolution. Some did not die, but most of them that fought, they're remembering that. And the Daughters of the Republic of Texas that are founded in 1891, they're founded in, uh, at the house of two cousins, and um, they come up with this idea. And so they start pushing this idea of Texas history. Now, in San Antonio... There's another group of, of members of DRT, and one of the people in this group is named Adina de Zavala, the granddaughter of the first vice president of the republic. And what she does is that she's a school teacher, and she pushes for the saving of the lawn barrack. She just doesn't have the means to do so. The state purchased the, the church in 1883 for $20,000, and now the lawn barrack's in danger of being torn down for redevelopment. And she was able to bring on another person by the name of Clara Driscoll, 
who was able to fund the purchase of the lawn barrett. And as a result, they save it. First thing she does is deed it over to the state of Texas. State of Texas says, we will pass a law. And the law basically sets the stage for where we are today. It is declared a sacred memorial to the heroes that immolated themselves upon that hallowed ground. And so the Alamo today is a sacred memorial to those men that fought and died at the Alamo because of the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. And speaking of those defenders, what is it about people like David Crockett, William Travis, that connects with people over time, through generations, into different centuries? It's their personality that really does it. When you think of David Crockett, David Crockett was the most famous American that was not the president. And he had books written about him. He had stories that were being told. There were plays that were written about him. So if you fast forward, he was the most famous American. And when he dies, people keep seeing him. You fast forward to a death that occurs in 1978 by the name of Elvis Presley. And what do people see? They see Elvis everywhere. Crockett was that per figure in the 19th century. Now, Travis, he's another figure that pops up. And it's because of the fact that he is this firebrand that a lot of people can see, hey, I wish I could do what he did. I, I'm that kind of person. I'm outgoing. I'm open. I'm ready to fight. Bowie, he's also a bigger-than-life figure. And you think about James Bowie. The legend of James Bowie lives on because of a knife he carried. He's involved in one fight with a knife, and he becomes a legend. And it goes from being concealed carry to open carry. So people relate to these people that are become larger than life. But where do they become larger than life? 1936, when the centennial happens and a lot of push is, is being thrown towards the Alamo, towards Goliad, towards San Jacinto, and people start looking at them and they start becoming more than just ordinary men. But this is where it gets complicated for you as a historian that pop culture propels this and propels certain myths along the way that we have to figure out, was it true, was it not? But it also keeps the story alive. Yes, it does. And uh, one of the interesting things about our story is that our story also becomes part of that Texan mythology. And early on, one of the things that happens is there's a speech that said, and one person says, Thermopylae had their messenger, the Alamo had none. So early on, the Battle of the Alamo is being compared to the 300 Spartans. So you are now making this battle, connecting it with the past. And even to this day, you can hear it happening in modern warfare, where men will say, this is our Alamo. There's an, uh, there's a, there was a camp named Camp Alamo. And where do they get it from? From this site, because... And it was the, in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, and they were surrounded by forces but they never knew if it was friend or foe, so they called themselves Camp Alamo. So you look at that, it's that story that overcoming overwhelming odds. They could have called it Camp Sparta, but instead they, re they went back to U.S. history and called it Camp Alamo because they re could relate directly to this men, the men that were here as soldiers. But you also have these moments like Fess Parker, television shows, movies that keep the story alive. People are still interested in it, but you also, as a historian, have to contend with what does it say about the Alamo? We do. Um, Fess Parker, you know, Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier. Great series in 1955 because it brings our story back to life. And it was a, one of the first ma major marketing campaigns for products that, you know, today we see it as normal. But Fess Parker did something that had not been done, and that was propel our story internationally. And that's where we get people like Phil Collins involved. And he, he certainly deserves his own podcast. He's going to get one on, on his collection down the line. But he was a, a kid growing up and watching that show. Yes, he was. And he saw the show and he fell in love with the story. And then he saw John Wayne's movie, fell in love with it more. And so we're grateful to these events and these these motion pictures and television shows because they keep the story alive. The only problem is that for some people, that's as far as they go. And so they relate to the movie and don't relate to the actual history, which is, is far more interesting than the actual motion pictures and TV shows. 
But that idea brings them here. And once they're here, we're able to communicate the actual history with them. And hopefully, when they leave here, they have a better appreciation of the site. And it just goes to show the Alamo is a worldwide phenomenon. Yes, it is. Ernesto, I've heard you say many, many times, the Alamo belongs to everyone. It's everyone's story. There really is something here for everyone, no matter your background. Yes. And this is, you know, this is everyone's Alamo because this site matters to everyone in a different way. And so for me, I am one of many caretakers that have kept the story alive. And so it's a, it's a tough job because this site matters. And so what we do now affects future generations. And we're trying to make sure that what we do is at the best of our ability because we never want to bring any shame to the site because the stories that happen here and it's over 300 years are important, whether it's the Spanish period, the Mexican period, the battle period, Civil War period, U.S. Army period, warehouse period. It all adds to the tapestry, which is the history of the United States and the world. Ernesto Rodriguez, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. We look forward to having you back on the podcast many, many times. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. For you at home, we'd love to hear from you. How did you first learn about the Alamo? And where in the world are you listening from today? Let us know in the comments. We're looking forward to reading them and starting that conversation with you. You've been listening to Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. <laughs>